Hello! In today's video I'd like to talk to you about my recent adventures with this HP 4145A semiconductor parameter analyzer. I'm not planning to do any kind of teardown or in-depth discussion about how this thing works in this video. Um, there will probably be something in the future at some point. But for the moment it's enough to know that this thing is from the early 80s and like much of HP's gear from that time it is completely built like a brick, absolutely bulletproof, and built to last forever. Unfortunately, this particular model has an Achilles heel, which is hiding right behind this flap here. And it is a 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk, um, this one being from 1989. Now, the problem is that this disk isn't just used to store user data, but this unit also boots from it. So, the only thing that stands between this being a halfway useful machine and a very effective doorstop is the magnetization on a almost 30 year old floppy disk and I certainly wouldn't trust that. And just to prove to you how important this disk is, when I turn on without the disk, all that happens once the CRT has warmed up is on the bottom left of the screen we can see error MO2, which means that it can't read the disk, and that's as much as it will do without the disk. Once you insert the disk, it starts reading it, and once it's read the OS and all of the text of it, the main menu will soon appear, like so. So my primary concern as soon as I got this machine was that I would really want to first of all read off the contents of the disk but also come up with a way of duplicating the disk if necessary so that I could keep this machine running for much longer and not rely on however long this disk will make it. Before embarking on this adventure I obviously did some research which wasn't terribly encouraging to be honest. Um, the main issue seems to be that the coding scheme that's used on this disk was never actually used by IPM PCs, so hooking up that drive to a PC is unlikely to yield um, any results because the disk controller probably couldn't understand the format. Now, I tried on two of my PCs and that didn't work, which wasn't terribly unexpected. And I'm sure if it like around for long enough, I could eventually find a computer that would read that disk, maybe an old Commodore or Atari or something. But frankly, that didn't seem too exciting to spend my, you know, weekends and evenings for the foreseeable future on. So instead I thought, well, let's see if there's another way to read the disk. And, I mean, clearly this machine has a controller of some sort built in, which is clearly capable of reading and writing that disk. So I thought, let's look at ways of hooking up that controller in there with the drive to something that I can talk to. The starting point for this is obviously the service manual. Um, I've got the original copy here, but you can download a PDF from Keysight, so they keep that around. And on here we have the floppy controller, and it turns out that the entire floppy disk controller is actually on a separate board together with the HP IP connector. So in theory, it should be possible to just remove this entire board from the analyzer and interface to it somehow to read off the floppy disk. I also managed to dig out the data sheet for the floppy control chip itself, which is very helpful because that contains all the um, commands and everything I need to give it in order to read or write to and from the disk. Unfortunately, that data sheet is actually very brief, so it's not too useful. However, a lot of the controllers back then were quite similar and mostly compatible. So I have this data sheet here from a TI floppy controller, which is actually really good. It gives you all the um, state diagrams of the chip. And so using this data sheet together with that one, I managed to interface the floppy controller to an embed. There wasn't any particular reason for choosing an embed in this case. It's just sort of my go-to platform for quick and dirty microcontroller hacks. Um, unfortunately, in this case, it probably wasn't the best choice because um, due to the layers and layers of abstraction and libraries, 
it's actually quite slow in some respects and one of those is the parallel bus interface which was dreadfully slow and it was just about fast enough to interface to the disk controller which is well quite pathetic in my opinion but um, I guess that's the price you pay for convenience. But once I had the embed talking to the floppy controller it was just a matter of writing some very crude firmware to read and write registers on the controller chip and then a couple of Python scripts on the PC to interface to the embed to actually read and write the disks. As for actually reading the disk itself, I went through a couple of stages. The first thing was reading off the raw tracks from the disk and that just really helped me to understand the format of the disk and just gave a bit of an appreciation for what I would need to do in order to write data back to disk later. And, I mean, in theory that would have been enough to um, make duplicates of the disk, but due to the way the controller works I can't actually write the raw track data back, so it's not really as useful later on, but it just was very good at the beginning as a sort of confidence boost to see that I'm actually reading data off the disk and seeing how it is formatted. What was much more useful in terms of getting uh, the useful data off the disk was reading it sector by sector because that gives me the data as seen by the floppy controller or rather the um, main processor of the controller which is what I'm ultimately interested in and also when I'm reading off the data sector by sector the floppy controller does CRC checks and everything so I could be quite confident that the data I read off was actually valid or at least I knew if there were CRC errors that I had bad sectors which the raw track information didn't give you. The first step in making a copy of the disk is then to get a new disk and format it. Now the formatting I did by making a disk image that just has the format information on it without the payload data and writing that to the disk in the track by track writing method. This is very important because the controller will actually write some special information to the tracks as well which is encoded by special characters or special control sequences in the data. So you can't just write your original track by track image back because some of your payload data would be interpreted as control data and your control data would be in the right place and which just wouldn't work. Also just an aside here, the drive of the 4145A will not deal with high density disks so you have to use double density or single density disks. Um, that's due to the different magnetic properties of those disk types and unfortunately the most common ones to find nowadays are high density so you might have to keep your eyes open to find some old double density disks. And once the disk is formatted all that's left to do is write your sector data back and in theory that should give you a faithful copy of your original disk. So let's see if the analyzer actually works off the copied disk. I've got the original here, safely stowed away, and I've got my copy here. And we can see it happily boots off the duplicate disk, which is really good news because it means that I can potentially keep using this thing for the foreseeable future. Now, just as an aside, a few years later HP came out with the 4145B, which came with a 3.5 inch floppy disk, which is obviously much more readily available still today, but it also came with a built-in function to copy the disk. Um, because clearly HP realized that not being able to copy the disks and having to buy replacements is not great so the 4145B had in the um, floppy disk menu an option to copy the disk which this one doesn't have. 
but I think this is good enough for me for the moment. I have one copy of the disk, I can make more if I have to, and I've obviously got the image file in a safe place, so that should keep me going for the foreseeable future. Now there's obviously another failure mode, which is that the drive itself might give up the ghost at some point. And the neat thing is that the controller itself doesn't really care about what kind of drive is installed there. Uh, the only thing that needs to match really is the disk and the drive. So for example, this is a 40 track disk, um, you have to use a 40 track drive. This is a single density disk, you have to use a single density or double density drive. Um, however, if the drive should die at some point, you could in theory just shove in a modern 8 track high density drive and use that controller in there to write the disk image onto a high density disk and in theory that should work. Again, obviously it would look quite crummy if you had a different drive in there, but at least it would keep working. Or you just get one of those floppy disk emulators and no longer worry about any mechanical wear. Finally, I would like to apologize for the lack of technical depth in this video, um, but I thought it wouldn't be great to cram a video full of technical details. So instead, let me point you to the website. I've got a link to it in the description below. And that contains all the information on how I wired up the embed to the floppy controller and the firmware and the scripts and everything else you might be interested in. So thank you for watching and I hope you found this video at least somewhat interesting. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Ow.